my little pretty. Yes, Satan. Come into the video. Satan, oh Satan, oh Satan. O oh, great Lucifer, O oh, horned one. Yes, come through, come through. O oh, great bull of the ages. Hi! O oh, crescent goddess, Inanna Ishtar. It's called an invocation where I come from. I come from the coven of the bleeding bitches. I come from the circle of the green, green witches. Hi! My ancestors have been very talkative today and very informative. I, um, I've always been a bit of a, a delicate flower myself and I find that the world to be rather indelicate. It's a personal thing and so I've always tried to find places close to my home where I could really settle down. I have a retreat. I think people call this a retreat in, in parlance, you know. People spend money and they go on retreats because they want to retreat. That, that's the uh, operative word, retreat. So I find retreat in the land and this is my retreat. So I'm always trying to think of ways that people could understand my videos, you know, because just to put a, a frame around what maybe you're watching. So this is a, a witch living on Vancouver Island, taking a retreat, taking a communion, building my family temple, um, stirring the cauldron of my inner emotions, and examining my life, and examining the life around me, because there's a lot to take in, right? The same reason you'd read a newspaper, I'm sitting in retreat. I want to keep up with my environment. I can't possibly ignore it, because my body is shouting it out every second of the day, you know? How could you not pay attention, but we always find ways not to, to the unrolling living book of our lives. And you want a strong spine, and you want a good strong voice, and you need retreat, and you need to have, you need to honor because you will invariably be drawn to the bonds of your family, good or ill though they may be, and try to resolve any of the especially critical difficulties with the living richness of your family. and. Because a lot of that richness, even the word richness, has been co-opted. So we end up lending a lot of our biology, a lot of our biological and celestial riches, to systems that are in competition to be able to arbitrate for human biology and for the biology of our mind and of our history which is a family history. So any subject that isn't linked to family history, I'm proposing to you, is suspect. Um, and at the very least, demands to be scrutinized for where it lost the connection to our own minds, to our own biology, to our own family. And again, it's, it's helpful to be really stupid at this point <laughs> and be stupid simple and just look at where your, your mind actually originates in a mother's womb. Chances are, right? It's one of those few areas in life that we can all say we came from the same place. We came from the same biology. Very different, obviously, punctuated with a lot of different qualities and stresses inside and out. That's a personal thing. We carry that around with us the rest of our lives. It's part of our book. It's part of our family Bible. And you want to covet that. You want to, That's a personal thing. You want to make the most of it. And any way that you try to do something with it that isn't making the most of it will be doomed to some kind of failure, mitigated failure, because life is rarely, you know, uh, as harmful as we may think it is, and it's often more harmful than we think it is. Um, and in that case, in the latter case, especially when we give up the function of our mind, which um, seems to be a critical component of even entertaining the equation of the, biolog the biological 
or as the biological imperatives of government and society, or a cybernetic civilization, and our own biology. So we, we can see this equation is taking place in terms of how much of our labor and how much of our mind we actually give to things whose ultimate effect or nature, whether this is intentional or not, is not very conscious to us. And so it's having a relationship to us and influence over us that not only we're not conscious of, but we don't seem to be inclined to become conscious of it. Particularly in ways that would force us to change how we view our relationship to the world at large. And that comes from conditioning. So that's not a sign of a healthy mind. Or at the very least, it's a sign of something that is always true, which is that our mind always has to grow. So you can see it either way. You have a choice in the matter. Because at the end of the day, the result hopefully will be the same, is that there's more encouragement in the world to improve our level of scrutiny of the world. You know, you want to try to send, or I do, or at least whatever will serve my own mind, hopefully is something that can serve a, a lot of minds, um, that has a, a universal nutritional value. And how I've attempted to do that is to sort of break down or make sure I make an adequate uh, provision whenever I stumble across something I think that is particularly important or an important distinction between what you have to think and what you might be inclined to entertain. In other words, you, we might not be able to say you should think or believe something, but we might be uh, more justified in saying that you should consider something because the dangers of not doing so, unless you know everything, are just too precipitous. But you don't need me to ask you that. Every day the world is asking you to do that. And the world will suffer or not to a degree, in so much as your labor adds something to the world to a great degree, the world will suffer or not to a degree, um, from your ability to listen to what the world is saying and scrutinize it sufficiently. Scrutinize your relationship to it. Because it's not a small thing that you have to offer. I think we're often made to feel that way. Again, it may not even be intentional. Society is so logistically enormous. How does one really factor in the importance of one's vote or one's labor or one's administrations? We see uh, through what I would call one church, whose character I would not totally impugn, because I would, I would like to use it, I would like to reflect upon it, I would like to use something of what it has to say to the world. And that is the church of Hollywood, the church of popular cinema. And as a church, it throws a wide net, gets a lot of talent, and generally is, finds a way to not only have a large pool of uh, very talented applicants to its various subsidiary industries, but, but usually, one way or the other, <laughs> um, and there are diverse ways. The most talented people generally emerge as the most employed uh, people, I suppose, by the Hollywood industry. And it, as a church, by right, offering the public, is telling stories that may be of interest to us loosely drawn from our lives, lives of people maybe just like us, lives of people who live in different stratospheres of human society, in the history, or in a contemporary level, or even in the future. And it will tell stories about um, human origins. It might tell stories about uh, that bear some resemblance to the era in which those, from which those stories are drawn. And when I say draw from the era, you're drawing everything, a little bit of everything from that era. So everything you know you want to look at with your mind, you want to look at it with as much depth and nuance as possible. And all that requires is the ability to entertain all probabilities. So one of the many probabilities is that the movies about certain eras also sustain the propaganda of that era, which is not of any little value. It's just one designation of all the information that an organism like the whole world is actually putting off. I may not like it myself. I prefer, I, I'd be willing to consider a world where no propaganda has to exist. But if you start coming down to sort of a very macro-human and transpersonal human level, 
I think we've only begun to scratch the surface in how humans talk and how humans talk collectively and through groups, even through governments and corporations, maybe through anything and everything. Certainly everything is talking through us. And when I listen to as much as I can, really, because, I mean, it's a sort of like being um, a telegraph operator for a, a system of celestial communication that has one trillion trillion channels, a channel for every star in the sky. Um, you're never going to find the full story. You're never going to get what you could confidently say isn't the most minuscule gossamer of knowledge. But you can take quite a handful now and then. But that actually doesn't depend on me. It depends upon a collection of minds that exist in and around the taping of this video. Ever. Some of them might even just be sleeping right now. Because word always gets around. I believe. Word always gets around. You ever notice that? Word always gets around. The most important things always get around. And you'd be surprised when you start thinking about what's important to you, how that message actually is very much carried by the environment around you, depending on how you tune into life. And I'm not saying one should just be in a state of morbidly <laughs> chronic optimism and gratitude every hour of the day. To me, like, shoot me in the fucking head, right? That just sounds stupid. You've taken something useful and turned it into a fucking hammer, which is what we do to everyone else, right? Control yourself. Feel good. Well, unfortunately, I don't... I don't know about you, but my, my neural chemistry doesn't respond to commands uttered by drill sergeants. And since I don't want to live in that world and I haven't actually joined the fucking army, I take the license of feeling however the fuck I want. It just so happens that I'm smart enough to notice that I see the world in different ways at the behest of forces, including emotions, that I don't completely control. And it's really worked for me to focus my mind on finding places where I can take a retreat and look at what all those forces might be telling me. And usually that retreat is not bound to one place. It actually comes through me through space and time. I carry it with me all the time. It becomes absorbed into my body. So I, I create a temple. My energy system is relaxing, and I'm having a communion with this environment. When, I, when that communion ends, not necessarily by just my own behest, but a combination of all kinds of forces that include me and mine and my family, I will pick up stakes, and I will draw something of this space with me into my body. So it forms some of the root system of my life. You look at these trees, right? They have pretty, pretty well-developed root systems. So if you want to you want to go to if you're going to school let's say and you're going to be a young person or an old person you want to have the best professors because it doesn't even matter how much they know you want to have the best professors you want to have the best kind of environment a good relationship for instance to get the best transfer of information you really at heart want to suck up the experience and knowledge that this person has that you could actually use in your life to be everything you want to be to grow to be as strong a tree as your family can be so i like hanging out with professors, Professor Tree. So meet Professor Tree. Hello. Um, the trees have already spoken to me. We've had a nice discussion and um, my grandmother has expressed some, some thoughts that I will relate to other members of my family and that I find very poignant. Very poignant. What I can share with you, or might, might actually be of interest with you, is how everyone in a family is a branch of the family tree. You may take this as an analogy, um, take this however you like, really. I mean, that's the great thing about my religion. You can just like, you can actually think whatever you fucking want to think. There really is no right or wrong to that. Um, there's satisfying and unsatisfying. And that's, that's what you'll really notice. Like, you know, a lot of things in life, you know, right and wrong could be replaced with satisfying and unsatisfying. Now, right away, you and I can conjure up all kinds of grotesque images about what some people find satisfying. Um, but I dare say, if, if they were encouraged and, and given the license they deserve by birth to feel actually completely satisfied enough of the time, they wouldn't seek satisfaction in grotesque things. Or things that are inarguably grotesque, because I'm sure there are things in any of our lives that someone might find grotesque. But we're talking about just in, inarguably grotesque uh, desires. Um, and, uh, you know, fair play. Um, it is a, a, a logical, it does follow logically, if you start to examine the world, that human beings as a whole have some fairly grotesque desires, 
or they are being effectively articulated by the society whom it has learned to equate with its own celestial biology in terms of how much we depend for knowledge and information and nourishment. It's not to say we shouldn't depend on any, but we actually have more room to alter our dependence on it, especially when you consider the wide range of Congress under, undergone by the entire energy system of the human body. So um, just going to a park, you've changed uh, what you're taking in. You might start to pay more attention to your body, even if you're stressed out, and, and know that you know your body's seeking something. It's seeking movement. Uh, it's seeking the, either the movement of your body or something through your body. So it's a lot of movement. Things need to change, right? And you can feel that when your body's achy. Something is definitely changing. It's not an easy conclusion to come to. So any place that there's pain in our life, something's probably changing. Um, that's an intuitive leap. Obviously, that's... Um, a sort of a whimsical way of looking at what basically you could just say is an ache in your body produced by, I don't know, a combination of a, um, deficiency in a, in a vitamin and the overproduction of, of another vitamin or mineral. You, you could, you really could just see it that way. Life's like that, you know. You can, you can that's a fairly, that might even be a pretty useful way to describe it. Because you can do all kinds of things about that, like take more vitamins and stop taking some others. That's one thing you could do. And vitamins have electrical properties as well, so, you know, it's a good time to look at how complex your body actually is. And we really notice that if something's not to our taste. So it's like you start trying new things, maybe. You're not quite sure what it is, and it'll probably be an emotional component. Though you'd be surprised how many people will will, sh will shake their head when I say that to them. Uh, there is there should be a large emotional component that will come with this as well, and that emotional energy is as important to you as your own sexual energy. It's creative energy. It's informative energy. It's um, neurology um, that moves through your mind. So emotion is like. Uh, a neurochemical intelligence that passes like a wave through different layers of your mind and nourishes them. Even if it's the most terrifying emotion, even if it's pure, like last second of your life fear, it is sending a rush of information through your entire energy system, even if it's, say, preparing you to die. Animals get that too, especially when they're being moved to slaughter. A lot of fear, <laughs> right? And um, that's changing. That's changing a lot about their life. In fact, it's it's going to end their life, right? And a lot of information is coming with that. So, if you look at, say, violent death, which is an awful subject, I know, but there's a point to be made here that it's so important. It's worth looking at death any death. Because in any death there are similar occasions for abhorrence, for disgust, for sorrow. It just seems like a cheap trick that people and anyone has to die, let alone die painfully. It's a cheap, cheap answer to life. It's disgusting. Reasonable people find it utterly disgusting that people have to be in pain, particularly pain causing death. But any pain at all. That's not something our, even our minds are programmed to really want to accommodate. And yet we accommodate, we accommodate it so well. So our body clearly sees pain as abhorrent, but it actually takes it into the vacuoles of cells and stores it neurochemically and biochemically, electrically. You could look at it different ways. Right? It's storing painful memories. It's storing impressions affecting functions that are then organized around protecting our brain from those impressions because there was so much information coming in that it stood to kill us. It was almost like a sign that it's time to die. But our brain was actually saying, no, no, we want to stay alive. No, 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 we're going to stay alive even though it's basically everything about our life is saying, just die. <laughs> just fucking curl, curl up and die. But have you ever had a day when something happened and you just wanted to die? Well, by the time we're seven, I put it to you that our whole biochemistry has wanted to die already for years. 
that's how much fear is generated in our in our nervous system in the first few years of our life including around conception just that even if you want to look at that as mere tissue you know being subjected to stimulus response that is taking it in an eccentric level of development that will form the very fabric of what you now call your mind right because your mind has a body as much as your body has a mind and all of this of course is going to be totally reflected in our relationship to the universe and what we know what we're willing to know what we're willing to accept as knowledge when we don't really know for sure and what it gets us especially when billions of other people are doing the same thing and we're social creatures so you can see the kind of immersive experience that the mind is acquainted with at the same time that as it takes the most painful impressions from the from the world I'm going to take a little voice break. So every branch of the family tree, every time someone has a child with someone else, two branches of the family tree are actually forming another branch of the tree. And if we wanted to honor the family tree, we'd say, well, that's that might be an important story to consider or a way of thinking so you're training the mind just like you train the growth of a tree and you want the tree to be strong and you want that tree to enjoy all the kinds of currents and electrical currents that it can because that tree happens to have a mind whose whose will is required for the optimum functioning of that tree and that will in turn needs healthy bonds with other branches in the tree and with the bark of the tree and with the flesh of the tree and with the memory of the tree and the other trees standing around you because one family has one tree and a grove of trees you know you can kind of see it the way you want right you see how the creative nature um, you know creative energy is you know unbounded essentially but it comes into bounds and the more it comes into bounds the more as we as a part of that creative energy come into the world we start to resist it and when we experience pain we're actually also creating resistance and resistance doesn't always amount to a restriction in life um, but I personally believe that it, that it can I think it can actually restrict the flow of life. So resistance can be seen as something that inhibits life. And resistance can be seen as something that presides, provides the kind of resistance that actually promotes life. So you can kind of, you could sort of see that and apply that to life. How, you, know, you might want to be a certain level of assertive, but not too aggressive. You might want to be, to listen and be open, but you never want to be like utterly open all of the time. Like, so there's more or less resistance to various things and situations. So even as you listen to this video, different minds will resist different things. Especially, I would say, and, and those people who are resisting a lot of it, you know, it might be a great sign of your intelligence because I think if somebody listened to something like this and was keeping track of the ideas that I was touching on, which formed a whole idea at the end of the day because my mind is a whole system, then they would probably be a little apprehensive and want to resist it. Um, Unless they found it charming enough, in which case, if they were letting it all in, or if someone is, you, you know, my hope, and my, you know, I would like to think that this is the kind of, kind of talking that would promote people's ability or will, or desire to take it apart, to scrutinize it, and to really ask yourself, is this really helpful to any part of my life? Or is this something I, I really can't relate to? Or is this something that I could relate to in any way? Is this something that might relate to my family or my experience of life and being born? You know. what, what rewards um, might appear in my life if I were to spend the level of attention that this man, as, like I, um, spend finding these places or talking in these ways or... Um, you know, just kind of creating this universe of neurolinguistics that might even only very loosely relate to reality. Right? There's there's a very ephemeral component of 
and uh, at best whimsy, at worst delusion, that comes with, I think, I think, developing this kind of relationship to a natural place and to a range of value, a richness to one's blood and so to one's words, to one's voice um, in any place, let alone a place that forms the fabric of the bark and the temple and the tree of my family. It's an epic thing, you know, relating to one's family. It's an epic thing to be heir to such an abundance of life, and in my case, happiness, but also heir to a lot of disruptions in the flow of life, and watching my siblings deal with that. They all, all people that have a lot of drive, and uh, I, I could see how they would need that, you know. You got to focus on what's going to move you forward in life. And none of us are in ideal situations. Some people, I guess, are less delicate flowers, and they think, "Well, you know, I had what I needed. I didn't. Maybe who cares if it's ideal? All the better if it hurts, man. You know, rip me a new one." change my life. Um, some people think that desperation and anguish is a necessary component to life. Uh, it may also uh, betoken the fact that it was a necessary part of their life. Um, you know, and fair enough. But I'm not sure if you could go so far as to say that it is a necessary component to life. Um, you know, we could discuss that. You know, I, if I had any say, I would be like, well, if it is, I would want as little of it as possible, especially for my own family. And if I want such a peaceful life for my family, why would I want to think that desperation was a part of life? Like, I don't even want to accommodate that because it doesn't fit into my master plan, the plan of life. And you and I, probably, if you've been in the world for a while, wouldn't have trouble thinking up the kinds of desperation that beset the average human being while they're making critical decisions, um, long before they even begin making critical decisions, critical decisions at the biochemical and neurochemical level to the brains, which really are like the brains of the operation. They, they may not contain all the wisdom of the universe, but they contain access to it. And they contain the proportions that befit uh, a human being. And that says something. Proportions of man. Vitruvian stellarium of celestial biology room for growth. You know, if, you, if I could just tease in the mind of the viewer a sense of like, it actually aren't going to burn at the stake, lightning isn't going to strike, the bowels of the earth are not going to open and envelop, and you may not become a social pariah, if you consider that there are a lot of churches in the world that have different things to offer, and you, you don't have to accept everything they're offering, you don't have to accept it as it is, you have to see it as a buffet. You know, if you like evolution, go eat at the buffet, uh, the evolutionary end of the buffet. I'm sure that will take you in the best possible direction, and you will find all the best hunting and the best food down the evolutionary chain. Um, but for those of you who have a spine and want to use it, books also have spines, families have spines, and you know, they like to decide their own stories about where they come from. Uh, my family has the right to do that. Now, if someone comes to my door and says, your child has to prioritize the story of evolution over their own body and then in their family tree, I will first politely ask you to leave. But if you're insistent, I'll probably kill you. I'll probably welcome you into my house, bind your legs and hands, put you into my basement for a week in the dark so you can piss and shit yourself until you say sorry. Because that's not only rude, I think that's actually one of the scariest things. And I think that all human beings should try to remove that kind of animal from the world. That's not even human. That's not even human. And you know, I've picked on the evolutionist in this case, but we could pick any church in the world. That's what they all deserve. That's how much illness they bring to the world. That's how much un provoked violence they bring to all of their relationships and I'm calling it out.
My family has been calling it out for generations. And I notice that there are people who don't hear the call. They don't hear the call. Those brains have shut down. There are some people who are overly aggressive. There are some people, they may not be aggressive, they may even seem poised, but they don't take things in. They never seem to notice anything, and they can say, I love you, and shut up with the same exact body language. And you'd be surprised how many people's body language utterly contradicts the way they consciously address me. There's a, it's not even that they're lying, it's that their whole body is contradicting itself. a hiker, a hiker standing there, so I'm just a quiet person. Aggression, ambivalence, you know, two ends of the same spear. Two knives in the same fucking handshake. And Jesus is usually holding both of them. You know, be at peace, says Jesus, be at peace. Be at peace, says Jesus. People start killing. Let's have an inquisition, be at peace. Let's have another inquisition, be at peace, be at peace. Let's have some world wars, be at peace, be at peace. Be at peace, be at peace. No matter what happens, just, just take it, because you have Jesus. You have the ultimate blanket. Right? Just suck your thumb, and Jesus will take care of everything. It's not respectful. People think, may think, yeah, I'm not respectful to Christianity. Christianity is not respectful to Christians. The people that are most hurt by Christianity are Christians. Right? If, think of what Christians are willing to do to other people, and I've watched them the whole life. Think of what was done to Christians. You know? If they need the forgiveness of anyone, it's not God. It's the people who converted them to Christianity or forced it upon them. There's the forgiveness that needs to be worked out. There's the learning, because there's much to be learned from Christianity. There's much to be learned, particularly uh, from how challenging Christianity is to the human organism, and how readily the human organism accommodates it. Okay, so we're very accommodating to Christianity. We uh, we accommodate it an awful lot, and we accommodate a lot, not just Christianity. Um, but Christianity, like these other major religions, in a way forms a uniform martial, uh, uniform code of martial syntax. So, you know, as I've said in other videos, you're left alone as much as you are because so much is being extracted from your family. Right? And it, the world is a pig, so it extracts as much as possible. And we've accommodated that quite a bit. And, right, and in the system that has the most to stake, it, it keep extracting and staying a pace of any growth, because every day the mind is trying to restore itself. Uh, and even that energy is used against us, right? It's used against each other, because it's pooled. The energy is pooled and then wielded on our behalf by the system whose biology we uh, uh, supposedly share, and which takes precedent over our own at almost every occasion. Right? And we call those laws places where the as-though divine biology of society takes precedence over our own families, our own voice, our own body, our own choices, our own lives, our own life or death, our own labor, our own relationship to our children, our ancestors. That's what it does. And those are called laws. In my family, laws are the voices of my family. So laws which squelch the voices of my family are not lawful. So my body, forget my own intellectual, philosophical nature, my own body lives with that paradox, and I suffer from it, right? It's a war. It's so contradictory, it's warlike. It's of warlike contradiction and insult to my intelligence. It's not even a nice dichotomy. It's not a very constructive dichotomy, right? Like a relationship where one person hurts another person and doesn't want to hear about how that felt, right? That's the world to our families. And that's our families to our own children. And that's our children to their children. So you might notice that I've thought about this quite a bit. 
And that reflects many of the decisions that I made in my life. As a writer, you make decisions, and as a human, you make decisions. And if you're lucky, the right elements come together, and you get to enjoy your mind, which has an importance on the order of that of my, my bonds with my own family. Right? I wouldn't want to lose those bonds any more than I'd want to lose my mind. And I, as I, those bonds were strained by, by the world of the gods, right? the heaven we're, we're forced to take as heaven, which is what hell, which is the definition of hell. Not the hell heaven as we want it to be, the, the heaven that we're forced to eat. You know, and even if it was heaven, we're forced, so much is choked down our throat that it might as well be hell. And that's a good way to curb the instincts of any animal, just to take even a food it likes and just give it huge quantities of that food and force it to eat it. And it loses its taste for it, drowns out its organs. So it, it's not as fine an instrument anymore, it's blunted. And it might even be trained to be cruel very much more easily. That's pretty barbaric, right? Well, everything I just described is probably the most accurate story that you could use to describe our school system. And, you know, uh, the Church of Hollywood and video games. And forget intense, let's just look at the effects, right? So, um, Hollywood movies, for all the, the, the cloth that they spread over all of the, the most qualified professionals to contribute to these enormous projects, if you look at all the movies being made over, say, a three-month or a three-year period, you'll start to see patterns of, in this particular church, the things that they talk about, which have all kinds of re socially redeeming qualities, and mirror pure entertainment value, which is fine in and of itself, there is yet a general theme to all of the movies being produced. Especially when you look at all of life compared to the life you see in movies, even though owing, even accounting for the fact that it's really technically only supposed to be fiction. Right? But fiction is never just fiction, right? it's storytelling. And stories are important, otherwise you wouldn't pay billions <laughs> of dollars a year to go see them. And you're not just being entertained, you're being told stories, right? Try seeing a film without a story. That's not a good fucking film, right? So you are actually engaging in the storytelling philosophy, in the storytelling tradition, because it is a philosophy. Storytelling is a science. Storytelling is a technology. Storytelling is a part of our biology. It's a part of this video. It's a part of life, you know? Do you want to lose your ability to tell the story of your life? Or, if you do tell the story of your life, do you want to be in, in a world where no one wants to hear or no one is sensible of that story? Because to the degree that people have ceased to be sensible of their family tree and of their own humanity, we have lost the sensibility of what we're actually saying to one another. How can you have a conversation with someone when you're not spending a lot of your time listening? I talked to someone today, I don't play golf, but I have a brother who does, and he practices all the time. If you don't practice listening, you're never going to become good at listening. And you do have to practice. It's not fair that you do, but because we're so overwhelmed with so much actually quite poisonous and torturous religious type information and fascist syntax, it is really a considerable process of rehabilitation to admit at your leisure a level of whimsy, a level of the romantic, a level of free association, a level of comfort to talking, um, among all the other things you might do to improve your capacity to observe your whole environment, which, you know, isn't going to work. I would say this to any child, if you don't first, you know, go to the bathroom and get comfortable, do what you need to do. And what works really best for me is having, is being able to do whatever the fuck I want to do, and to journal and commune with nature in my life as I see fit. And it's something that I've practiced. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut this off for now and say thank you, as always, for listening. There's some, uh, there's some kids coming. Must be on vacation. <laughs> I love young, uh, I love young folks. 
younger folks. God, it doesn't seem that long ago, quite honestly. Never is, really. But life changes. Thank God. Thank the gods. You know, and, um, you know, people and families deserve to know the generous role that they've played in the growth of their family tree. This includes uh, sons and daughters-in-law. You know, when, when Jesus in the book of Matthew says, I will separate uh, a man from his son, I will separate a mother-in-law from her daughter-in-law, he's talking about breaking the family. There's no way to spin that in a nice way. But it's almost subliminal because, you know, I, I think Christians have been reading the Bible for a long time, and if you know any Christians, they're pretty obsessed with the Bible. And they, they're, you know, it's always a, if you go to Sunday school, it's like, how many things can you remember? You know, it's very, very charming, right? I'll give you a quarter if you can remember, you know, everyone's probably learned, whoever's ever gone to Sunday school has probably learned, you know, John 3.16 or, in the beginning, the end, amen. I actually really remember the part that says, if anyone alters these words, they're going to be tortured for eternity. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's, that's before they had copyright laws. <laughs> and of course, the great irony, if you're not, you know, a spineless Christian, is, is that that book has probably been passed around more than a fucking hockey puck uh, by human history. I mean, it's the most finely woven bullshit. I mean... If a used car salesman wrote the Bible, he would definitely get employee of the century. I mean, it's, it's lathered on pretty good. And you look at the level of intelligence of, of touching the mythic and the archetypal, the inner dialogue with the divine, uh, a sense of spurious evil that comes from our loins and the underworld, the fires that await those who... Uh, remained untouched by the searing grace of the Holy Father. Um, it's, uh, wow, it's some pretty raucous stuff. Unfortunately, as a read, especially having, it's not even so much that the Bible itself is terribly provocative, but you're reading this book in an environment saturated with its scar tissue and with its, with its poison, with its fascist syntax. Lovely day. Mountains, little snow, white, cirrus clouds, beautiful leaves, sunlight, the sound of young men throwing rocks. I don't know if you can hear that. My butt is falling asleep. I'm gonna have to adjust my position here. Oh, position adjusted. Good job, Captain. You can even see kind of the roots a bit better here. Every member of a family tree, if it even need be said, improves the life of the whole tree. This is a school. You know, if, I don't know if everyone's ever looked at Hinduism and Indian gurus tend to come from lineages. Uh, Buddhist gurus tend to come from lineages. The Dalai Lama is part of a, a, a whole tradition of lamas, a string of lamas, a certain family. So the story goes, you know, they, they knew where the, the next lama, next Dalai Lama was going to be born. You know, I guess they probably, you know, took their child away uh, and beat him, apparently. And then uh, he became really happy forever. <laughs> All that story ends. And if you believe that story, that, you know, my God, um, I guess the world, God help us. <laughs> Because God's the only one who can. <coughs> but these these are little things. Um, you know, when you're a Christian or a Buddhist, these are little matters because you have uh, 
drank the Kool-Aid, as they say, and it is a life-changing Kool-Aid. It has strong spiritual dimensions. You get some good discipline. Um, you learn some traditions that require that discipline, that will only offer up their charms to that discipline. And it is an arduous and austere discipline, to be sure, because ask a Buddhist or a Hindu monk how many lifetimes it might have taken or will take the average person to ever sip from the great and holy cup of their infinite bliss. And it's like, it's a long fucking time. You know, not in your lifetime kind of thing. But a little goes a long way is usually the theme, right? It'll make you a better person, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's sort of like joining the army, right? Is there ever going to be like some final military orgasm where it's like, oh, we finally achieved maximum death and everyone can just sit back and like, you know, stop raping each other? You know, because military people actually have a lot of penile dysfunction. And, uh, you know, women who work out a lot and stuff like that can have menstrual disorders. Women who don't work out a lot can have menstrual disorders because uh, it's a part of the body, particularly for women, uh, owing to the part of the body and also being women that are more inclined to have a lot of cramping in the sexual region of their body. That's a personal matter, right? But women in the pain of their body has something, have something to say and has something to say. That's all that need to be said, has something to say. Go and bend your ear to the women of the world and what they have to say to you, what their bodies, what our daughters' lives have to say about what they're enduring from Christianity or from all the isms of the world. You know, everything that's attempting to claim copyright ownership of the inner regions of your brain, which is where you undergo also some of the most ephemeral, ephemeral contact with the celestial dimensions of your family tree. So, um, made by fill-in-the-blank corporation, right? This naming or this copyright claim is going on at every dimension of human society because the world is at war with our nature. And it needs to be. So are the gods of our scriptures, so are the god concept of our sciences is at war with our nature. And I've talked quite a bit about that earlier in the video. And the tip of its sword, of course, are all the constituent organs of those corporations and of those churches. The soldiers. And there's all different ways that their flesh is owned legally and metaphysically by the system. And... Uh, talked about education, of course. And, you know, these churches, they're there. Um, I don't see any benefit in, in waking up tomorrow and somebody's eliminated, eliminated all of them and all of their members. You know, this is the fantasy that you have when you start to see how dangerous the average human being actually is to every kind of safety that we really want. Um, and how amazing it is we, we don't all kill each other every day. I think it's only because, and the reason why nobody kills us or no government kills us every day, is that we've reached that sweet spot of effectively and slowly torturing everyone else in the world. It's like a sweet spot we reach. It's sort of like that plum spot in a golf club where you can just like perfectly brain everyone and have them still give more of their energy to the person wielding the club. You know, we've got that we've got that sweet spot and that's a story and that's something you need to do in your mind. Or at least have have something you might consider picking up like a lens or a mirror and looking at to that vein, right, that cancer in society, that that dislocated or non functioning of a part of the brain. Because I felt it in people and I felt it in my own family, this inability for the brain to function in certain ways and to think in certain ways. Ethically particularly. The ability to rotate situations in their mind and consider all different kinds of factors. With basic kinds of assumptions like, it's better to assume society is dangerous for us than it is so good for us that we shouldn't examine society and be willing to scrutinize it to the nth degree. If we're willing to go to the farthest reaches of the universe and plumb the deepest depths of the core of the earth and go into the atom, you know, or anything that science claims to be able to do billions of years into the past, we should be able to peer as far as we like and scrutinize as much as we like every aspect of all knowledge and religion in the world and just go, fuck it. And it's not hard 
maybe you don't have to, but I think it's not hard to actually refute most religion and science, which are the same thing. And I think religion and science should be thought of as the same thing. And if you see them as the same thing, you see that religion and science are both pretty corrupt. They are corru they have a cor they're not even really pretty corrupt. They have such a corrupting influence that they're probably the most corrupt and yet most authoritative institutions in the history of the world. And their functions are very similar and overlap quite a bit. And you see that particularly with the Catholic Church. But also the New Age, same thing. If people aren't thinking or factoring in or making room in their minds, in the depths and the celestial reaches of their mind and their memory, for a family and for a child of celestial value and of living riches that of any knowledge in the world, then they're fucking themselves and their children. And they've been fucked really fucked as much as any child any pedophilia has ever fucked a child and anyone who goes in the army has to be sodomized either figuratively or literally they have to be pansy boys right it's better to have homosexuals in the army right it's better to have homosexuals the army wants homosexuals you know you only find homosexuals in prison right you whether you like it or not you're going to be a homosexual if you're in the army. You have to be. You know, yeah, women get raped, but men get raped too. In fact, the whole thing about the army is is raping. If you want people to do things, disgusting things to other people, you've got to do disgusting things to them. And you've also got to take control of their higher brain function. So they feel like the fact that these disgusting things are being due to them is a good thing because they can't ethically rotate the situation. And that's, what's ha that's what churches and sciences do to our brain. And that's what, in a sense, essentially, science and religion is for. And when we retained s some sense of what this was doing to us, we called it alchemy. And we called it black magic. But alchemy has a better meaning. The way alchemy is used, it basically alludes uh, Chaucer, for instance. Uh, I don't know if it was like Francis Bacon or something. But I uh, can't remember now. But uh, Faraday. Uh, we're, we're, it's not some austere clique of specialized and elected people who deal with uh, the electrical properties of the universe because alchemy is actually about neuroelectricity. It's about bioelectricity. It's about electrical currents that extend into our own thought process, our desires, and the creative fabric of the universe. That's why you elect people. That's why they're of the elect, right? L also represents Saturn. You wear his hat when you graduate because you've been learning a certain way of looking at current, looking at the current of life. It's been teaching you to come away from giving, allowing your family to occupy the celestial regions of your consideration. So they're just apes, you know, they're just apes, so they're just sinners, you know, they're going to get chewed up by the world eventually. It has some surviving grace by God, but it's pretty much at his leisure, and at the end of the day, you're pretty much a dead carcass as it is, and the only thing that really animates you is God's grace. Well, that's exactly what an army wants to do. It wants to animate you with something that's already rendered you dead to get you as close to death mentally and emotionally and physically just like they do with cancer treatments and then animate you with the life and the function that they want to give you. Because the, the, the medical system is a form of recruitment for the military as well. So when you're someone's patient, you're like a, um, an applicant to the army. And the army uh, needs a certain number of casualties, a certain number of deaths. So you're going to die in combat, probably, if you, if you deal too much with a medical doctor. And what are they combating? Well, they talk about combating illness, but they're actually combating you. And if possible, they, they, can, they can kill a great number of us, but they'll get some really good soldiers and doctors out of the general population as well. The ones that they don't manage to kill, right? We could say, oh, they have a nice life, you know, and they went to school, they managed to get a medical degree, and so they, they weren't killed. But they're really good at killing other people with impunity, just like other rich people, and just like other poor people. They just do it in different ways. So we live in a world with psychopathic soldiers, soldiers of the elect. Now, the alchemy could also be 
just our biology and the intersection of the realms of life and death in the stars and in our own neurology and in our own endocrine system and sexuality or emotions or stomach which are all thinking systems of the of the entire mind so every part of the body is a part of our mind and every part of our mind is a part of our body and this is a celestial integration uh, and this is the real alchemy the the whole electrical um, uh, stellarium the whole electrical electrical uh, nature of our whole mind and of our family tree. So that's a little bit of that today and around the trees, great teachers, they've been really good. So, you know. Oh, hey, Nana. Oh, Satan. Oh, Lucifer. Oh, all of it killed the Christ. Killed the Christ. He's been talking about peace. It's not working. You know. But God is at war with Christians, right? So. A Christian can't be at peace. So what's wrong with a Christian that they feel so peaceful? <laughs> if they can't be peaceful and you feel peaceful, because you can't reasonably be peaceful when something's at war with you and wants to steal all the children and get you to steal all the children, the ones that aren't completely brain dead get really good like salesmen of trying to get other Christians come in. And they can be exceptionally intelligent in some ways, like most people who come from the education system and really stupid in others. And stupid people are more likely to form the general pool for really cruel people. Whether they're overtly angry or hostile, which is a layer of the mind that generally converts emotions and sexual energy into aggression, almost like flash, parboiling it. Um, and then there's other people who, who dole out the incendiary uh, dislocation of their mind in more, how should we say, charming ways that are as much evident by what they say and do as what they don't say or they don't notice and often have trouble thinking in both cases because cruel and stupid are really at the core, no matter how they look, is actually a similar diminished capacity for reasoning and for particularly using the higher abstract faculties and having access to, again, the, the limbic uh, levels of emotion and instinct, which are all currents of energy, electrical currents. And talking, I will, I will finish with this, talking, for the love of God, you know, is an important factor to exercise talking about your family, the good or the bad, honoring all that it says, because in there you will find the voices that have been condemned to hell and the demonic and the non-existent and the ape-like and the chimpanzee and the primordial ooze and the fucking Big Bang. You will hear something truly explosive that through your biology and the power of family bonds, because shit has happened to our families, you will feel and begin to be compelled to find places to honor the however incendiary emotional components through which we are able to exhume the family tree from uh, having been largely destroyed and only think about what kind of mind, what kind of voice would require a war to destroy it. Its ability to tell its stories, like my body's telling the story. Somebody has an injury, I guarantee you as they get older they've got a story behind that injury. When I hear, I heard a man talk about an injury today and I don't know him that well, you know, but it's like a bookmark. Someone tells me about an injury, I talk to them later on, I'll be like, hey, tell me more about that injury. Because they'll have a lot to say about that injury. But they may not want to say everything there is to say about it. And it'll go back to their family. Every injury you have will go back to your family. Because we suffer injuries in league with the injuries that our family have suffered. It's amazing how many people don't want to even think about their injuries, how it might be connected to their body. A lot of people don't even see the preposterous lack of functioning that they actually have as a whole mind uh, as anything injurious to themselves or anyone else. Those people are, to me, some of the worst people you ever run into. That's why I speak Dago, which is my mother tongue. Dago is the language of assholes because I noticed that um, however and whenever I can avoid assholes, my Dago much better. And uh, I'll leave you with that little golden nucket of wisdom that of the asshole of my life. Fuck her up.